and I'm going to start the webinar. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, people are just now coming into this session on tests and quizzes that is going to start at 1250 p.m. Eastern. So come on in, settle down, get comfortable, and we will start in just a few moments. All right, welcome everyone. It is 1250 Eastern, uh, 10 minutes before the top of the hour, wherever you are in the world. Um, thanks for joining us at this uh, really fun session with Christina Schweibert from Northwest State Community College. She's gonna be focusing on tests and quizzes. I'm Josh Wilson from Longsite. I'm gonna be your moderator. I just wanna let you know, if you have any questions at any point, feel free to put those either in the chat or in Q&A. Um, Christine is going to be having us, uh, she's going to be leading us through a game. So you're welcome to, to toss your questions out there and we can answer them once the game is complete. Um, this should be really fun. So this session is going to be recorded. It is being recorded and it will be available a little bit later on on the Sakai YouTube channel. If you have any challenges with audio or video, definitely let me know in the chat and I will do whatever I can to help. So with that said, Let's uh, let's turn this over to Christina. Let's have some fun. Thank you, Christina. Thanks, Josh. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina, and I get to talk to you today about tests and quizzes. The general workflow for tests and quizzes is fairly simple. You create your test. That's either importing it, building some individual questions, pulling from question pools, you can figure the settings. This is the dates, the time limit, submission, number of submissions, the test layout, the feedback the students can view. The students take the test. If there's a time limit, they see the time timer when they take it. They can do multiple submissions if you enable it. 
the student submitted, the test is graded either automatically for most question types or manually. If you have any short answer essay, file upload or student audio response questions, you can have rubrics to help grade them. And then once you grade the test, the students can see their, or once the tests are graded, if it's automatically, you don't have to do anything. But then the students get to see their feedback, the scores, comments, the graded rubric, anything that you create. It's a relatively simple workflow, but tests and quizzes are always challenging to set up. So we are going to play a game of Family Feud. And the question that is going to be before us is what are the biggest challenges of online tests? Not necessarily Sakai's tests and quizzes, but just online tests in general. So the way we will have this work is um, I'm going to start the game here. And I want you guys to throw out in the chat what you think are the greatest challenges of online tests. And we've, got, we've had our uh, survey of experts to give us the number. Academic integrity, cheating, bingo. Number one, the greatest challenges of online tests is to prevent cheating. So I'm gonna tell you, talk about that for a minute first. So Sakai has a checkbox in the settings for the honor pledge. If you check this box, the students are required to check the box that says they will not give or receive aid on this assessment. And if they check the box, they can't cheat, right? Yeah. I tell my instructors, all of them, all online tests are open book, open note, open Google, and phone a friend. There is nothing that can absolutely prevent this, not proctoring, not anything. This is going to happen. The only thing you can do as an instructor is find that line of the cheating being more difficult than it's worth to them. So I get to talk about my tips for using Sakai to discourage cheating. And my first tip is, honestly, if you saw Melissa's presentation yesterday, avoid the publisher test banks. These are all in Google right off the bat. So create the questions in your own words, reword the test banks if you need to, or create your own. Create questions based on other um, course content, videos, class discussion, presentations that you create, things that do not come from the publisher. And then my other advice is to try to create higher level questions. Bloom's Taxonomy have questions that are less definition, that are easily Googleable, and more about true understanding, application, evaluation. The other tips I have to avoid cheating is Randomize, um, if you have multiple choice questions, randomize the answers. When you're setting up the questions, there's a simple option there to randomize the answers. And this just shuffles A, B, C, D around. This doesn't necessarily help with the open book, open note, open Google, but it does help with the phone a friend, the students sharing answers. Another way to help discourage the phone a friend type cheating is to randomize the order of your questions within a test part. So Sakai has tests divided into parts. Each test contains at least one part. And that's kind of like a section of a paper test. You can have part one be the questions for chapter one, part two be the questions for chapter two, or have part one be your multiple choice questions, part two be true, false, part three be your short answer essay. But if you go into the part settings, you have the option for having the question order be random within the part. So each student gets a slightly shuffled set of questions, but it's not completely shuffled unless you have only a single test part. If you have part one be your multiple choice questions, 
Part one will still be only multiple choice questions, but they will be all shuffled around. Next good way to prevent the phone a friend type cheating is doing the random draw from question pools, which if you saw the panel yesterday, Melissa Faber talked about, create a question pool, draw a random set of that. Each test part can draw from a single pool, but again, you can have multiple test parts, be able to uh, have each test part draw from a pool control how many questions that it draws, what pool it draws from. And that makes it then so if you've got a large enough pool, students don't see all of the questions. They can't um, share what they didn't get. It also, if you have a large enough pool, it helps keep your tests entirely off Google. It takes a little while for them to collect all of your possible questions and answers. Another way um, to discourage the phone a friend type cheating is to control the feedback for your tests. This is in the test settings and the test settings can be changed at any time without affecting students who are actually taking the test. So you have your option for when students can see feedback and what feedback that the students can receive. Let me zoom that in a little bit. So if you are offering feedback on submission, this is gonna seem obvious, but don't include the correct response or you are going to have one student take the test first, answer it all, pull up their feedback and then share their laptop or share their screen with their friends who will then get all of the right answers. If you want to show students the correct answer, use the option for showing feedback on a specific date and set that date to be at some point after the due date. So that way the students can't see the right answer until after they should have all completed it. So I said, all te online tests are open book, open note, open Google and phone a friend, but we help discourage that by trying to create some unique higher level assessment questions, randomizing whatever we can and controlling feedback availability. So we are back to our menu, and I think I saw someone say accessibility. Someone did say accessibility. All right, we're gonna call that close enough, managing extra time for the students who require the additional time on a test. So students, the common accessibility requirement is extra time on a test. But you may also have students who need an extended due date due to family work or medical emergency that they couldn't take the test when they were supposed to, or students who talk to you about doing an early submission because they know they are not going to be able to um, be online at the time that the test is supposed to be taken, that they'll be on vacation, they have their work schedule, they have family commitments. So Sakai's got a really, really sweet way of letting you manage the extra time for individual students. And that is the exceptions option in the test settings. Under the settings for the exceptions for the uh, time limit and delivery date, you can choose an individual user or a group if you have any set up. If you leave any of the dates blank, it will just choose, it'll set um, whatever is your global open date, due date, and late submission date. But if you need for like the common thing to be able to allow the, a student extra time, just change the time limit here in this drop down, and that student will get um, the extra time. They will have their own time limit. You set that up, click Add Exception. It appears down here. 
and has the option to edit or remove that exception if need be. But then once you save those settings, that student will have the extra time or that student will have the extended deadline, the early open date, whatever you choose to set um, to let them be able to access the test as they need to. And that is such a really simple but really useful option. All right. So the uh, another one that was submitted, Christina, was connectivity. Several people suggested this. Nope, that was not one of our uh, expert survey answers. Wow. All right. Um, how about uh, when you submit a test, it fails to submit? I don't have that one was not one they come up with either. Wow. But OK, um, here, here, here's another that was suggested. How about the time needed to create online exams? I can, that we got. It's more converting paper tests, but it does talk about um, a quick way to try to create tests, especially if you already have questions um, available outside of Sakai in a Word document. We had, a minor issue in the past couple of years where we had to rapidly get some tests online. And so a feature that sometimes seems to be overlooked really came to our rescue. And that is um, Sakai's markup text. And the markup text is a pretty quick and easy way to create a subset of quest to create a test. Um, it doesn't, it can't contain all of the question types Sakai offers. It's limited to the multiple choice or multiple select, true, false, fill in the blank, um, numeric response, and short answer essay. But those are the some of the most common question types used. Let me show you this document. This is a screenshot from a Google Doc I have shared with a couple of my subject matter experts. We are working on creating a hybrid uh, principles of machining class. So we have tests about, you know, lathe and milling and drill press and all those fun things. Rather than try to create these questions in Sakai and then go in and edit them as my subject matter experts correct me because I do not know machining. I created a shared Google Doc and just created the text here using the markup text format, which is simply the question number and the question. For multiple choice, it is your letters with a period behind them and an asterisk in front of the correct answer. You can have the hashtag randomized to randomize the multiple choice questions. You can have specify correct and incorrect answer feedback. But this let us collaborate on these test questions. Yeah. Be able to work on building the entire test in a shared Google Doc. This just is giving you the closer view of the formatting. But then when we go into Sakai, create the test, copy and paste that entire document, that entire list of questions in at once. Click the next button and it parses out all of the questions. You can make sure that it's getting the points correct, the answers right. And then with, within just a couple you know, clicks, this becomes a full test or question pool and then you can go in and do any edits you need, such as adding um, question types that aren't supported, adding any text format if you need images. But this lets me go from a shared Google Doc with my subject matter experts um, to a full ready to go test in about two minutes. 
And the formatting required for the markup text is very simple. Um, for multiple choice or multiple select, it's adding an asterisk before the correct letters. Uh, for true false questions, you have the word true or false on the line below the question with an asterisk in front of it. You don't even need the incorrect answer. Sakai can figure out that if the correct answer is true, the incorrect answer must be false. Now fill in the blank. You have the answer on a new line with an asterisk in front of it. With numeric, um, same thing, except the answer after the asterisk is in curly braces. And for short answer essay, there is no extra formatting needed, just question number, question, and go. So this lets you draft up a test in Word where you can just keep typing everything straight down or in Google Docs shared with an instructor or subject matter expert and be able to put this into Sakai so quick and easy. I know um, my husband uses um, Canvas at a school he teaches at and Canvas has an ability to create a test from a Word document, but it has to be uploaded to a service that converts it into an XML file, and then that XML file uploaded into Canvas. So you can't see if your questions are formatted correctly until after it's converted and uploaded. Whereas the markup text option, you can preview it right there and be able to go. So we have a few others that have come up in the chat as well. Um, right. Another one is uh, confusing expectations. Uh, when when students can submit, what kinds of devices they can use. Is, is that something that our experts have noted? That is not. All right. How about the, the overall superficiality of the assessment itself? We have something similar and that is creating meaningful tests. there. So a meaningful assessment is trying to assess more than just rote knowledge. Uh, try to under, get measure a student's true understanding, not just do they know the definition of a key term? Can they pick the best answer out of a list of four? It's a, an ability to measure skills and critical thinking and their general problem solving skills. And unfortunately, the most common assumption is that, you know, your essay questions are what you need for meaningful assessment. And you can't, if you want meaningful assessment, you can't use anything that is automatically graded like true, false, or multiple choice. If I put on my instructional designer hat, I'm going to say that is not necessarily true. You can have meaningful assessment with multiple choice questions, it is just much harder to do. You have to be very purposeful in that design. But what um, I get to talk to you about with this is a couple other um, automatically graded question types that are good for more meaningful assessment, but are not um, always thought of. So the first is calculated question. And this is another example from that principles of machining course that I'm working with. Um, the speed that you make a lathe spin around is dependent upon the like defined cutting speed of the metal and the diameter of the chunk of metal that is spinning around. Again, I do not know machining very much, so I apologize for using all of the wrong terms. But to use a calculated question, you would set up that math problem and simply replace one or more of the normal numbers you would predefine with a variable in curly braces. And you'll put your answer in double, a variable name in double curly braces. And then when you click this extract um, variables button here, it brings up the option of setting 
the range for the variables. So you can set minimum value, maximum value, how many decimal places it can have. So some numbers would not make sense to have decimals. Others, you know, one, two, three, four decimal places, whatever it will, uh, whatever makes sense for your particular math problem, your particular calculation. And then for the answer, you specify the formula using numbers, any of the variables, and some of the mathematical constants. You can have pi, the um, trigonomic functions. But then you put in for the answer, the number of decimal places you're expecting and the tolerance. So what range of possibilities? And then when the students take it, every student gets a slightly, it gets a different number, gets a different calculation and every attempt gets a different calculation. So this is a great way to create um, practice quizzes that they can retake endlessly to make sure that they understand the calculation process and aren't just memorizing the numbers that are the right answer. The other um, really useful automatically graded question type for creating more meaningful assessment is the hotspot question. Hey, Christina, before we move on to hotspots, there is a question in the chat about calculated questions. I wonder if now might be a good time to put those out there. Um, sure. Dr. Chuck wants to know, do those work well when you edit the question text and add a new variable? Same as if you edit any other test question. So if the test is already published, it you have to retract it. If you're editing one before it's published, you know, jump in edit or add any variables you need, go in and change the uh, formulas if you need to. But yeah, you can easily you know, edit it just as you would any other question. All right, great, on to hotspots. All right, so the hotspot question is similar in theory to the labeled image questions we all know. Here's an image, there's a line pointing to this particular component. You know, what, what is that line pointing to? Except what makes the hotspot question a little more authentic is you don't have some artificial line pointing out what is the important component of this image. The students have to recognize that on their own. So for setting up a hotspot question, the instructor uploads an image um, creates a um, hotspot component, puts a label in, and then for each one, draws a box on the image just to indicate where that answer is, what zone um, is the spindle of this mill, which is the knee, which is the controls. And then when the student goes to view it, they get the list of the components they click on each one and then have to place a, for lack of a better word, a pin on that image to identify the components. So again, unlike a labeled image, this doesn't have the lines and letters pointing to what's important. The student has to be able to recognize that on their own, which gives it an extra level of authenticity because in a real world, the milling machine does not have labels on the pieces. Christina, I'm, I'm curious, with your instructional designer hat on, um, what would you suggest as an accessible hotspot question alternative? So thinking about students that are either blind or low vision. It depends on um, the field. The hotspot image does have the ability to include an alt text tag, but that can't provide enough description to identify the entire parts of it. Um, for some, it might be a case of using a 3D, you know, if you, they can come into the classroom and do a 3D model. For this principles of machining class, it would not be practical for a low vision user to even, uh, unfortunately, be able to be in that class because it is 
a very large hands-on component and someone who can't see where the saw blade is results in not knowing where their fingers are. So I think it's gonna mostly depend on the um, instructor and the subject being taught, um, but definitely try to do, you know, if you need to do a uh, paper one where they can use a accessibility thing to zoom in if they are just low vision, um, alt text, 3D models, anything that will let them be able to see, you know, or not see, but identify the various components. Does that, that answer all your, your question, Josh? Yes, thank you. All right. So meaningful assessment um, can be done with any type of question if you're willing to um, put in the effort to try to make it as meaningful as possible. But the hotspot and the calculated questions can be very useful tools in building a little more meaningful assessments. So how are we on time, Josh? So we are two minutes from the end. So you're okay. thus far, your timing is amazing. And I will say that there are no other suggestions from the from the, the participants. So all right. I'm going to just quick reveal all of the answers. Is there any of the other three that anyone really wants to see? Um, before we run away? Dee, Dee asks for stats. Question statistics, because we love data. We love all the data. So the question statistics are really useful for identifying problems with a question. It's either worded poorly or questions or problems with the learning experience that a topic is not covered um, as well as it needs to be if the learning material is not sufficient to help students be able to answer that question. Sakai has two options um, for being able to view that information. When you're viewing the test scores, there is the statistics tab and there's the item analysis tab. So I'm going to show, talk about the statistics first. And the first thing on the statistics page is some overall test statistics. So this has things like the test score um, mean, median, and mode, the range, and a lovely little bar chart showing the score distribution. So you can see how close you are to the perfect bell curve. As you scroll down the item now or the statistics page, it shows you the information for each of the test questions. So the very, for multiple choice, it shows you the answers, which ones are the correct answers if it's a multiple select option, and the number of responses selected for each of these. For short answer essay questions, it shows a breakdown once you've graded it of the score distribution. So how many, how did you grade that essay? And that gives you again, the bar chart here. So you can see how, how, how your curve is looking. <laughs> the item analysis gets into a little more of the nitty gritty statistics. So like the statistics, it has for each question, the percent that was correct. But then it also has the percent correct for the upper 27% and lower 27%. And then also the discrimination index, which is a number between negative one and one that kind of gives an idea of how valid this question is. If it is a positive number, that means that more of the students who scored highly on the test, more of this upper 27%, got that question correct than the lower 27%. 
for a question like um, this third one that has a negative number, that means more of the students who scored poorly on the test got this question right compared to those who did well on the test. So that indicates that there may be a problem with that question. And my instructor has to go in and uh, perhaps re either revise that question or look at the instructional materials and make sure that that concept is being covered and identifying any points of confusion. And then zero um, indicates that pretty much both the, um, that it was equal, that there was the, the balance of the students who got it right in the upper part and the students who got it right in the lower you know, section were the same. So there's not, you know, a, that's, you know, an iffy question. The one is the everyone who did well got it right and no one who did poorly got it right. So it's a way of seeing um, just how valid some of those test questions are. All right, it is 1.22 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'm glad we got to pack in statistics uh, right at the tail end there, that was great. Thank you so much, Christina. We should probably wrap up at this point. Um, I'm really glad that all of you were here for this. There's some there's some really good stuff in this, in this session, which uh, even some of our experts who were in here hadn't seen before. So thank you, Christina, for this. Um, and thank you all for attending. So next up will be round two of Sakai Team Trivia starting at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, so seven minutes from now. So thank you all for attending, and we will see hopefully all of you at uh, Team Trivia in just a few minutes. All right. Bye, all. Thank you so much.